let's technically though, Russ, to your point, is there really, I mean, there's the approach of, you know, I, we call it, you know, the dark fiber approach, the lit fiber approach, the conduit approach, the, these different approaches where different, where the service provider owns some assets, the service provider owns assets. I, I get what you're saying, but what model actually is, or is there a better model that says, hey, who's best to run and operate infrastructure, customer service, deployments, technical, like, I mean, there's a lot, if, if we all want the same goal, I mean, the whole point of public private partnerships is the same goal. Is there really, look, we're all good at certain things. Who's better to do certain functions versus just saying, well, I just, because I have the money, I'm going to own it. You're setting me up for a punch, aren't you? I mean, that's, that's simple. <laughs> the provider is the, is the, is the no brainer on this one because they're the, they're the, they're the expert in the field. Allow them to do their core competent and let them do their work. However, that said, 90% of the cost is putting a plow in the ground. If we can offset some of that cost to allow the provider to be more, more, uh, more efficient at what they do, let's do it. You know, so don't, don't you be doing that to me, Nick. <laughs> I, uh, I would answer this a different way because I think it's a, it, there's no, there's no right answer, but I saw something interesting happen in my home state about 10 years ago. There was one company that held the contract for the, all the state agencies and, and uh, schools. And the CIO said, we're going to support local providers. This company that held all these contracts was from out of state, obviously they were public and, and it did not help the provider. Okay. So we can talk about which, which public private partnerships the best, but who do you want to partner with is the question. So you've got the provider that has been trained by uh, federal funds in the small independent territory to spread their investment out like it's a commercial real estate property, right? So it's all about ROI. It's not about delivering to the neighbor or stri you know, striving to deliver on a schedule or a timeline. It's, hey, this is the amount of people I have. This is the amount of funds I have. I don't want to roll out too fast. I have 10 years to roll out this fun these funds under Connect America, uh, you know, ACAM, whatever. So there's, this, there's that group. There's another group that got into the ISP game they're making a good living and they're getting a little longer in the tooth, whatever, you know, for whatever reason, they look at it like it's a lifestyle business. Okay. And then there's a third provider, which I like to classify myself as that is willing to go out, borrow funds and build and build quickly. Right. And using wireless, using fiber, using whatever tool in the chest. And then what's interesting too about this conversation is we're talking now about a fourth provider where the municipality is our own provider. And so that's, that lends your, itself to the question you just asked. So the question then becomes, who does a community want a partnership with, right? The, the lethargic company that's all based on ROI, the, the, the gentleman that's, that's got a retirement in three years and taking cash out of the business and not really wanting to put capital in, the people that are really aggressive, or, or just give up and, and just do it themselves. Who gives a shit? Just bring me my internet is the answer. That's true. <laughs> and here's the thing too. I don't offer gig. Personally, I don't offer gig everywhere. I would love to. So the question to Russ of what's the, what's the best speed? The best speed is where you stop talking about speed. Does it work for everything you need to do, right? And that is uh, fiber is the only thing that's going to future-proof us. We're going to have gaps. I'm in, a, I'm in a state of six people per square mile. You can't do fiber everywhere, right? Uh, you're going to have gaps and you can fill those with wireless and other technologies. In the end, the true answer is fiber everywhere, future proofing. It's going to create jobs on, on in locations that are having to resort to satellite. Uh, it's going to put assets in the ground, right? And we need to make changes now policy-wise so that that is forced upon new builds, new construction, open trench, co-location on util, everything, right? It kind of begs the question then, I mean, not everywhere has a Russ and an Eric that are passionate and have a soapbox to talk about this. They have people that maybe, maybe they're just not as attuned to broadband and why it's important, right? Well, I think a lot of states don't have, you know, broadband plans, right? But, but I think the good news is you're seeing more and more 
um, do it right They're They're and, and this, this last year has been obviously phenomenal for, you know, our, our, our industry, um, because of the focus of, you know, everyone having to work from home and naturally, you know, the world still in, in many cases still, still happening, right. Because of this connection we have right now. So I think it's brought it to the forefront and, and States, towns, uh, you know, ISPs, private equity, everyone, it's like all of a sudden the light bulb went off, right? We, we've all been in this fighting this battle forever. And over the last year, it's like the light bulbs went off. So I think the good news is, you know, there's a lot of activity, but now things are getting really interesting in some aspects. And, and, and Russ brought up, you know, a huge one, right? We're, we're now starting to have government programs competing with each other. And it's like, they're not even talking to each other. Um, and it's really making you things mean government confusing. not talking to each other. <laughs> it's so <laughs> odd. That's crazy. That I, would, look at that yeah, I don't even know that, how that report. came out of my mouth. <laughs> look at the 477 report. It only reports on broadband. It doesn't have middle mile. The only maps out there that show middle mile are private where you subscribe or the USDA where they funded middle mile. So how do you take a, an FCC 477 map and overlay the USDA, overlay a program like CAP2, ACAM, RDOF, Nobody's oh, what I, I'd love to show you what I got. I'd love to show whoa, you. Whoa, 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 what are you doing? I'm going to no, <laughs> say, hold on, you know, hold on, big guy. Hey, hey, uh, <laughs> uh, the next one of these, we need to talk mapping. We should do it because there's a whole hour we could talk about mapping. And I, and I, I agree with Brian. How ironic is it right now that all our schools and libraries are empty and our kids can't, can't, can't connect to, to get education, right? At good intent, unintended consequences. We as states, Wyoming did it too. We did it in Colorado. We go around, we think we're doing a great job. We go and hook up all of our schools and libraries. We get them on these big state networks. We hand out these fat contracts to these providers, multi-year contracts, and we have no obligation to have them serve around. So how ironic is it right now, these last nine months, every one of these providers are getting paid fat checks. Nobody's riding the infrastructure, right? And the kids can't connect. We, it's Washington State's going to put, I'm trying to push a policy forward called Anchor Plus One. I think Shelby's calling it two and through, but I think what we ought to do is make certain that every provider that wins one of those lucrative contracts also has an obligation to at least provide what they could do. I'm not saying they have to, but give us some consideration for around that anchor institution. You know, I, Tony, Tony Young was the CIO in Wyoming when I was there. And Tony used to come to me and he says, Russ, we've done a great thing. We've built this, this school network out and we've, we've spent a lot of money. State spent $20, $30 million on this network and we're killing it. We're doing great work. Well, what ended up happening is, and he says to me, the reason why we're doing good work is as we build this out, we're, we're encouraging those providers to do great work in the last mile. And it wasn't happening. What was happening is they were cherry picking. They'd come in, they'd grab that big fat check, that last mile connection, they'd get their fiber in there, get it paid for, and they'd run the hell away. And there wouldn't be an obligation to serve anything beyond that. We need, to, we need to change policy. We need to encourage. I'm not saying we make, because I think that's, that's a tough, that's tough language. But I think we encourage, you know, hey, give me some plan as to what it looks like when you do build to this small town of Lost Springs, Wyoming, four people, or JM, 15 people. And when you build to the post office, you get that anchor tenant, right? How are you going to serve the folks around there? Who are you going to partner? It doesn't mean you have to do it. You can partner. Partner with Visionary. Partner with somebody else. But show us a plan that you're considering everybody, not just the fat, the fat client. Russ, those, those those kids can connect, man. They just got to sit in the parking lot with their mom in their car. <laughs> um, what's the problem? 